Hey, this is Christian with Collision Hub. Well, if you've watched any of the news that's come out on any of the trade publications lately or what's going on on Facebook and some of the social media, well, you've noticed an increase of post repair reinspection videos um, and some of the feedback that's coming from those. Well, we thought it'd be a great time while we had everybody together up here in New York to sit down and talk about post repair reinspections. What are they and what are people looking for during them? So I've got a panel of experts. Thanks, guys. Thank you for having us, Kristen. Uh, you got a, made a long journey coming up from the south. Yep, both, Michael and I are both from North Carolina. Awesome. Larry, you know, we're just hanging out. This is kind of I'm hometown. from down the road a piece. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> now, guys, there's, there, you know, obviously what the two of you are doing, most of the videos um, coming from what you've done, what you've done at your shop, and a little bit of what Mark's been doing up in Maryland. Um, let's talk a little bit about what is a post-repair inspection and, and kind of what you guys are looking for individually. You know? All right, well, I'll start off. Um, I started Collision Safety Consultants three years ago to do diminished value claims. And that kind of morphed into when I did diminished value claims, I inspected the cars or I had a professional inspect the cars. Once I found something that was a little off kilter that I didn't think was right, I would take them to a professional, someone like Larry or Michael or my father-in-law, Ronnie Pack. And then we started finding a lot of problems. Uh, we found that cars were not sectioned properly. We found that they weren't using corrosive protections up in the rails. And we started finding things that would uh, affect airbag deployment. So from diminished value inspections came post collision repair inspections and we just started offering a free service if anyone had had their car fixed that we'd look at them for free and that's where that came from and then i actually partnered with um, michael bradshaw at k&m collision up in hickory um, my belmont office is about an hour and 15 minutes from him and now when we have people in his area uh, i go to michael and i got him get him to inspect the cars so what are some, as the, you know, kind of the repair, the expert on it, when you start to do a post-repair inspection, what do you start looking for first? We don't ever look to, to be very thorough. We want to do a basic assessment. If, if we do a quick walk around of the vehicle, look at the gaps, um, maybe pop the hood, pop the trunk, you know, look at the area of damage, we can tell rather quickly if things were, were done pretty well or if there's some issues that require further, you know, assessment. So... Typically, everything starts with a visual inspection, and most of the time, it ends up being much worse. Um, you know, so we don't go looking for issues. It just sometimes there's no way to avoid them. All right. Now, Larry, you and I look at post repair a little bit differently just because of our experience in the courtroom with them. We're usually out reinspecting a car post repair because it's now in court and something's wrong with it. But one of the things I've noticed, and, and you probably have more insight on this is it seems like as the car is getting more technical, the repairs are actually getting a little worse and post-repair findings are getting deeper than they ever were before. I think uh, the biggest problem in the United States currently is 25, 30 years ago, uh, you had mild steel vehicles, um, not a lot of unitized structures. Um, it just was coming up to the 80s where the, the citation came out. And uh, you had mild steel, you had still a lot of chrome on cars, chrome bumpers, not a lot of real bumper fascias. And you'd have to change the bumper fascia and some chrome parts, but a lot of parts were fixable. But cars took two weeks to fix. No one had rentals. Nowadays, everyone has rentals. We have more plastic stuff uh, on vehicles, more composite stuff. And we're seeing that repairs can now be done in three to five days is what everyone thinks. And it can't. Uh, th that's the big problem. They're trying to make unrealistic cycle time numbers. And the, the, there's two levels of this uh, um, post-repair inspection that's being done. You have the ones that are being done that are repairable, that aren't going to be a court fight, that the shop can renegotiate for, uh, with the insurance company for additional repairs or under a new claim in some cases where they'll go back after the shop. But the forensic engineer I work with, we will get called in sometimes by the insurance company versus insurance company. It's at his shop. Let's say the car goes to Kevin's shop and he gets it in there. It came from uh, uh, Bill and stuff and the car is there and he says, oh, there's some major issues here. Now the insurance company's like, well, wait a second, it was fixed at one of our shops, so we're kind of responsible. Well, the insurance company might call us in to look at it for them. So it actually kind of takes them out of it a little bit. And it's not that I'm doubting what he says, and he says he's doing a quicker post-repair inspection to find the issues, well, we got to go full bore. We, there's many times where we're measuring the car, we're doing destructive testing if the lawyers tell us to do it, meaning if we find bad welds, we're ripping them apart. 
We'll actually cut sections out in some cases where the, now the front rail is no good anymore, but we cut that section out. We'll put it on a, a Rockwell hardness test to test the metal. We'll put in a tensile strength tester and pull it apart. We've x-rayed rims or x-rayed parts to find porosity in welds. I mean, you're talking a real crazy way of, uh, a, a scientific way of looking at it, but once again, it's not what we think, it's what we can prove. You know, in a court of law, it's not about the truth, unfortunately, it's, it's about the law. And it, it's about what you can prove in a court of law, not what you think. You can't just point fingers. You can assume, but you can't point a finger and say you're guilty because, well, this is what I think. And uh, that's where the proof comes in. So I think there's two levels of it. Now, one of the things I noticed from kind of some of the stuff that you guys have put out lately is <clears throat> it's one thing in a post-repair reinspection to find where maybe a procedure wasn't done completely properly. We all know that there's struggles with proper welding and some things. But a lot of what I'm seeing coming out lately in reinspections is where stuff just isn't done at all. Things are, are written to replace and they're repaired and uh, procedures that are on estimates aren't even done at all in the shop. Can you talk a little bit about what you're finding there of just, just what's charged but never done by repair? Well, and, and I'm not a repairer, Michael is, but I can kind of speak to what I see. Um, like, it, it, what it seems to be happening is the estimates are written by people that don't really know how to write an estimate. And then it's going into a shop that's run by someone who's not following up on that technician. Um, if you had quality control, like I've seen here at Mid-Island Collision and that I see at uh, K&M Collision and I see at Pack Brothers Collision, there, there's someone that follows that car through the entire process of that repair. And there's no way the stuff that Michael and I find uh, and, and Pack Brothers finds that if it was at a shop that they had a QC guy that came in I mean, if a rear body panel was supposed to be replaced and somebody just beat it out with a hammer, um, you would know it. Um, Any time, uh, and uh, someone said to this to me the other day that was a, a shop owner um, in Charlotte, Scott Autobody, he said, when it comes to replacing metal, I make sure somebody puts eyes on it. If it's a welded structure, I make sure that someone's pulled the all data on it or the manufactured OEM specs. Like Larry said, if you don't go to OEM specs, you're not fixing it right. Just the other day, uh, one of my videos, the, a, a lady took her Lexus in, um, the repair estimate required replacing the rear quarter, and they didn't. And the answer from the body shop was, oh, well, I've replaced your windshield and I saved your deductible. Well, there was three estimates written and a supplement and nothing mentioned anything about a windshield or anything about a deductible. So you can't commingle funds and you can't put something on paper that the insurance company paid for and the body shop wrote and then not do it. During the post repair inspections, we always find stuff that was supposed to have been replaced, was billed to have been replaced, but it wasn't. And the reason I think this is going on is um, because there's not enough qualified technicians that know how to perform those operations. It's much easier for any body man to beat a quarter panel out or to beat a rear body panel out than it is to replace a structural component, to, to weld it in properly, to, to rivet, bond, and glue. Um, you know, being through the manufacturer courses like, like Larry and I have been, you take one tech for one manufacturer certification course and he can put in excess of, of 100 plus hours in training just for that that one course and we have probably less than five percent of body shops out there I you know and and that's probably being more generous um, <laughs> than, than I should be but you've got <coughs> maybe five percent of body shops that have just undertaken one of those programs and sent technicians through those programs so they get a vehicle in the shop and you know they're already under the gun for cycle time. Um, they're already struggling to make a profit because they're not trained properly, so they don't understand you know, what needs to be done to the car, what do I need to bill for, what's included, what's not included. You know, It'd surely be a lot easier to make a little money on this job um, to just bang this back out instead of replacing it. Um, well, it's technically robbing it. <laughs> I'm robbing right, the job. <laughs> right, I'm robbing the job. And, and not only that, but you know, maybe most shops have, have one tech that they think could could handle a job like that. Well, you know, it's not enough for the volume that the shop's doing. Um, and even, you know, we've looked at enough now, there's a lot of shops that don't have a tech that's capable, period. 
Well, the Internet's kind of changing. I mean, with searchability now, and the consumer can get online and find answers to questions and find a lot of these videos. And I think that's why we're seeing an increase of consumers requesting post-repair reinspections. I think for a lot of shops, it's important to keep in mind that these don't come about because an insurer uh, requests them or an insurer gets involved in this. These are usually consumer-requested post-repairs. I've never met a shop, really honestly, that'll say, I I'm okay with doing bad repairs. I want to make money. Everybody wants to do a good job. And there's a lot of shop owners out there that think they're doing a good job, but they don't know that some of this may come up. So you let's don't know talk what you don't know. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> let's talk a little bit about what are some things that a repair shop owner or manager can immediately do in his facility that can ensure that he's not on the bad end of one of your reinspections. Go out in your shop and put eyes on or hands on or have someone go out there and follow up on the procedures. You, you know, when you're hanging a bumper or you're doing a skin on a door, um, some of these things, that, that doesn't require, you know, a, a whole lot of engineering. But when it comes to, you know, someone going in and putting a rail in or putting a rocker in and putting structural things in, I think the, the manager or the owner, someone should be responsible for going behind that tech and, and checking those things. We, we developed a couple of uh, charts or pages that would, would assist any shop. It's basically from my consulting at shops and seeing the same problems over and over again at multiple shops. We came up with about 15 things in each department or what we call departmental checklists, which is basically the tech would sign off on what he did. And these are the 15 problems we find. Um, you know, were photos taken? Uh, was the backside of the welds checked? Uh, 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 did you spray weld through primer if necessary? Because some companies don't want it. Uh, did you, uh, uh, did you uh, get all the welds? Did you, um, did you check the backside to put any primers? Because some shops actually allow the frame tech to spray the backsides of the panels because he knows where he welded and someone else isn't doing it. Well, he signs off on that. Well, then the foreman, manager, or owner would have to come over before the car leaves the frame machine, would have to come over and then sign off. Oh, I checked it. So now, if there's something wrong later on, and let's say Mike's putting the car together, and I did the repair, and Billy signed off on my repair, and Mike gets to me and says, oh, this isn't done over here. I'm not in trouble. I signed off that I did it. He double-checked my work and signed it. Now it's on him. That's an excellent idea. You know, that's now where there's accountability, a culpability, where I can say now, well, I'm not going to go yell, Larry. You checked my work. So either you rubbed and stamped it or you're incompetent. Which one is it? And that's where you stop a lot of that you know, things from happening, even at the estimator's level, did you open and check the trunk for any damaged components? Because I've had shops that have four tires on the car, it's fine, and then the smartest guy in the shop, the detailer, is washing the car, cleaning it up, wiping all the edges, and he opens the trunk and there's a blown out tire and a broken rim. Well, because when they went to go tow the car, the tow driver took the wheel out, put the wheel on, instead of it being a spare, it was a full-size car, they put the tire in the truck and no one ever checked it. Or the smartest guy, the detailer, comes in and goes, hey, Mike, um, you know, um, how come the airbag light's on? What airbag light? Well, now you're looking to get rid of the car and the airbag light's on in the car. Now what do I do? The car's ready to leave in an hour. I told the customer already. Now I gotta send it to the dealer for some, you know, uh, just resetting the seat, you know, to, to, to uh, recognize the weight. So these are the problems that I put at the beginning of the estimate. Michael, as a shop owner, what are some of the checks and balances and controls that you have in your shop that ensures what goes out the front door is perfect? Um, really one of the things that, that Billy says, um, and I struggle with it more and more um, as we grow, um, but uh, to look at each car, um, whether it's not me, um, whether it's one of my estimators, to go over each car and QC it. Um, we've developed some standard operating procedures. I know that's a big buzzword in the collision industry nowadays. Um, but, you know, essentially what I believe um, has helped us the most is training our techs, reinvesting in our techs, um, and making sure that they have access to all the proper information and, and equipment. So, I mean, if, if I was talking to another shop owner, um, and we've had the conversations before, um, make sure your techs are trained in their craft and, you know, know what they're doing. Because... There's a lot of guys in this industry, and I, I'm not talking down on anybody by any means. Um, there's a lot of guys that have been doing it for a really long time, and you know, they're skilled guys, but they don't they don't understand new vehicle construction um, because it's changed so much. I mean, they're, we're dealing with stuff now where even going back five years, I mean, you, you go back five years, and it's just a dramatic change, and it it's concerning to me. Um, as as somebody that that is is running a family business with my father, um, 
the amount of money and, and time and that we continually have to reinvest every, every so often because it's just, it, it's evolving. So no matter what happens in your body shop, the most important thing is that the car gets done right the first time when it leaves your building. It's about the next accident. It's about the next owner. It's not about what you're getting paid for right now or saying that I didn't need to do this or that. So make sure that you implement some sort of standard operating procedure, some sort of quality control checklist, something that's ensuring that everything that goes out your back door is something that you won't mind, whether one of these guys reinspects it or another post repair reinspector in your area. If you have any questions about post repair inspection or you want to get in touch with these guys, be sure to see us on the website, collisionhub.com. We'll put you in touch and we look forward to sharing more information with you about repair procedures and what's coming down the pipe next year. Thanks.